good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. It's wonderful that you're here with us. I'm so excited. And I know my friend Anne Kelly is also excited to introduce another episode of The Living Theosophy and D. This afternoon, we have a very, very warm welcome for Westcott Loudon, who is a comparative religious studies professor. Bit of a mouthful, but we're going to go through his bio because he's a really, really interesting person. Westcott lives in Alberta, Canada, and when he was a teenager, he set himself a simple goal to make sense of religion and to read the Bible. He started to attend church about this time, but eventually he was confronted by inconsistencies in the Bible and things he didn't understand, and more so contradictions between Christianity and science. But when my grandparents passed away, I became desperate to know some of life's big questions. For example, what happens when we die? What are we doing here? In 2011, Westcott had the fortune of being introduced by a, a traveller in his life at the time he met to the works of Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, which he delved into. And through the works, he could understand that all religions share specific truths in common. This was a revelation to Westcott at the time, and I quote again, I came to realise one ultimate common thread connecting all religions, one persisting theme I had recognised everywhere, on every continent and in every religion, at one time or another, all these religions and communities have looked to dreams, visions and altered states of consciousness as meaningful sources of information. The website is enlighten-university.com. It is dedicated to encourage people to pursue a spiritual life with discipline and authenticity in helping all achieve a richer and more fulfilling life. He says, I quote, there is no dogma here, only an unapologetic commitment to the truth and a habit of keeping our feet firmly on the ground. And that is from the Enlightened University, which I encourage you all to look at. In 2019, Westcott published an autobiographical work, which is also available on Amazon for a very, very reasonable price, called The Way of the Dream, the Autobiography of a Contemporary Mystic. So we are very warmly welcoming our esteemed speaker and dear friend, Westcott Loudon, this afternoon. Westcott's also published another book called The Gentleman's Guide to Women in Attraction, but we're not focusing on that this afternoon. We're looking at his other work, but that may be interesting as well. If you want yes. to buy a copy, that's available. <laughs> if you want to know about The Gentleman's Guide to Women in yes. Attraction, he's your man. <laughs> yeah, I figured, you know, I had all that uh, dating advice in my head from when I was an atheist. I might as well make some use of it. So. Of course. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. We love it. We love it. We'll include the link down below for those of you who are interested. <laughs> we will. Well, you you run a uh, Theosophical Society in, in London there? Well, um, it's living theosophy. We're theosophists, meaning we're students of theosophy, which is right in line. It's synonymous with everything that you are doing as well. It is the comparative study of all the world's religions. It's actually the exact same stuff, just under a different name, because we believe that these teachings should be free and available to all. And anybody and everybody can have access to them because they belong to humanity. So that the textbook for humanity, what we're doing is something that is like a little a group of people that have no titles and no uh, hierarchy. We're just students and we just want to share our experience to be able to get these teachings out into the world. We've just been kind of, um, you know, finding different texts and limping along and then realizing how much we had in common. And now we're working together. This channel is growing and more people are coming and they're hungry for this. They want to, they don't want to find it in the churches. It's not there. It's, it's mm -hmm. here and everybody has access to it. So that's why we're so excited to have you here because you are right there on the money. So, yeah, I, uh, it's it's kind of interesting to hear you guys put it that way because actually, what inspired me to uh, to start the channel was when I was first introduced to Joseph Campbell's work and I saw the series Mythos. I uh, actually contacted uh, the Joseph Campbell Society and asked them, you know, if I could share some of the uh, some clips and and you know publish some of his work. And they were very adamant that no, it you know it's very expensive to preserve these things and. Uh, you know, there's, there was a very, you know, there was a lot of talk about money and law and copyrights. And so yeah. I thought, well, this is something people need to be able to get access to, you know, for free on online. There's yeah. so much that's out there that, uh, yeah. yeah, so that, that really inspired me to start the channel. So 
all these people now going online, this is the tool that the ancients would use if they had access to it to reach people. And so that's what mm -hmm. we're gonna do is try to be able to be modern. These, these teachings are ancient, but this is the world of today. And they're on the yeah, phone, true. so they they don't aren't going to be reading scrolls in a cave, nor are they going to be at these lectures <laughs> for two hours. Um, they're going to be on their phones, so that's why we're doing this. So Westcott, we've got so much to talk about. Where do you want to start? You're just such an interesting character. Tell us all yeah. about it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was a heck of a journey, you know, and it's uh, I don't know one of the one of the things I've noticed with uh, some of the people who've read the book is they say that um, the book kind of ends abruptly and and you know I, I did that quite on purpose because I do feel that uh, you know I'm still in the midst of the of the journey in many ways so mm. yeah it's uh, yeah. it's always an ongoing thing. I had a question for you, Westcott. Um, going through all of your stuff, it is a brilliant website. Please, we'll yeah, put it is. down below for for you to take a look at the videos that uh, Westcott has. On his website, he covers everything Christianity, Buddhism, shamanism, uh, Hinduism, death and dreams and Carl Jung and, and so much more. But one of the things that is uh, very close to my heart is the things that you talk about is the similarities of the near-death experience, the out-of-body experience, bringing back the teachings, the ancient sacred universal principles. I was wondering if you would share just a little bit on the NDEs. Um, I know that you've had quite an experience, which is explained in your book. Uh, you, we can touch on that if you wish, but I wanted to see if you talk about NDEs and the commonalities of the ancient teachings, please. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really interesting thing. And it's it's something I, I dedicated a few videos to here recently. Um, the, the thing that's really challenging, especially I think in Western religions, is a lot of the experiences that people have in NDEs don't necessarily coordinate well with uh, some of the religious literature, you know, there, there are even some fundamentalist Christians and Muslims who have suggested that the near death experience is deceiving, that it's false, because mm -hmm. uh, many times the near death experience doesn't coordinate with religious dogma. Mm -hmm. And that's always something I've had a terrible, terrible issue with because, and, and you know, this goes back to, you know, my, my commitments to science, where you know, it's understood in science that ultimately observation has to be supreme. If you have a hypothesis and then you run an experiment and you make an observation that contradicts that hypothesis, then you have to either throw that hypothesis out or adjust it. And I think that simple kind of thinking really has to be applied in religion today, where even if we have very beautiful, very lovely, very complicated and convincing ideas, if there's nothing about those ideas that can be validated directly through, you know, a, a religious experience, then we really have to be suspect. And uh, I think that's where the NDE experience is very useful. And I also think that uh, it ties in directly with what uh, what we see in psychedelics. And that to me is really interesting. That's mm -hmm. a big frontier that's emerging now is mm -hmm. recognizing that, you know, if you take a, a near death experience and you set it side by side with say a DMT experience, there are many things that are remarkably similar. And I think that what that helps to prove or, or show is that ultimately all religious and spiritual ideas are rooted in the unconscious mind. And I think that in and of itself goes a long way in helping us to understand why science has such a, had such a difficult time in uh, coming to certain convictions about religious ideas. Right? Tell us, Westcott, when, when you... When you completely turned away from religion and you maybe had some dark times, there was obviously something inside you that kept kept you wanting to return back to this. Like, um, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a peculiar thing. Like, I, even when I go over my book and I, I think about my journey, uh, there were many times when I just gave up. It was it was too difficult. It was too costly. It was it was just too much, and uh, I just walked away, wiped my hands, and uh, you know gave up on the problem. But I guess that's you know it, it says a lot about my personality. You know, I just had the experience today where I'm uh, I'm currently working in computer science, and you know I I, I have a 
a problem and I, I get frustrated and I say, okay, I'm just going to let it go, go do something else. But even when I try to do something else, my mind keeps going back to the problem. <laughs> you know, I, can't, I can't let it go until I've got that solution. And so, you know, even when I would walk away and I'd say, that's it, I'm done with religion. I don't want to even think about it anymore. I'd see a documentary or somebody to mention a book and then I'd have an insight and then I get sucked right back into it. So mm. I don't know if it's uh, providence or just my incessant uh, curiosity <laughs> that, that motivated in a lot of ways but uh yeah i definitely i i always get sucked back into the into the problems i haven't solved so <laughs> you're you're rooted in skepticism mm, yeah. i i love that i think we all should be so skeptical and not to be um drawn into false um false dogmas and uh well and that's that's a i i love to talk about that actually because it's it's some of the it's one of the most difficult things when it comes to religion, because when you think skepticism, you ought to automatically think atheism, right? If you're too skeptical, mm. you end up becoming an atheist. But uh, what I found is that ultimately, you know, that skepticism is fine to a degree, because even when you talk about science and, and math and physics and everything else, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of faith to even do an experiment. Uh, you know, if you, if you say to yourself, like, for instance, you know, when Albert Einstein published the theory of relativity, he said, uh, you know, if, if you look at a solar eclipse and you observe the position of a star next to the sun, the position of that star will be moved by the sun's gravity. Well, people had, an, had to have enough faith in Albert Einstein and enough conviction to actually turn the telescopes that way and uh, make that observation, right? And, and I think that in many ways, the level of skepticism that we see in the academic world today is filled with so much resentment towards Christianity and the, you know, the woes of history that uh, many academics and, and skeptics are not even willing to consider stepping into a religious experience to test some of the ideas that are put out there. And I think, again, that's where, you know, the future of psychedelics could play a major role where you say, well, here's the hypothesis. You know, we believe that there's a spirit world. We believe that there is an intelligence that, you know, sort of oversees that spirit world. And if you enter an altered state of consciousness and go far enough with these methods, you can observe all of that for yourself. Well, that that presents a really big challenge to skeptics and atheists because now you've given them an experiment and you've said, if you don't believe us, recreate the experiment and tell us if we're wrong. And, uh, you know, I'm quite confident that, that that will really in a major way signal the end of uh, atheism and materialism as it exists today. But it will take time. You know, that'll, that'll come slowly. Yeah. <laughs> Westcott, I have to ask you about the DMT. DMT, ayahuasca, bees different there it's different than opiates and and all of that cocaine and things like that the dmt i was wondering if you would flesh that out because that question comes up a lot is that does it take you to the veil is it real what is your experience with dmt and um and being able to access the inner self through things like that yeah you know i've i personally haven't done dmt myself i've had the opportunity for quite a while and uh that's another thing that comes with a lot of this stuff is that um, you, you learn a certain amount of respect and, and fear when it comes to it. Because one of the things that I find kind of interesting is that if a person has no religious leanings, they're not spiritual at all, uh, they seem to be able to explore psychedelics a lot more than somebody with spiritual leanings, I think. And this is kind of just a, you know, I don't know this for certain, but it's a suspicion I have because I've noticed you know, I've spoken to friends who I remember a good friend of mine, he would do LSD all the time, you know, and, and he seemed to be, he'd go for bike rides, you know, he'd listen to music. And uh, I, I just couldn't understand it because I did LSD once and I had this profound life changing experience. And I think that in many ways, um, when you look at those psychedelic substances, it, it, it really it's not enough in and of itself. You don't just do a psychedelic and then come to a spiritual conclusion. Uh, you know, it, it has to be coupled with religious methods. But when you do pair it up with religious methods, it, it, it can be profound in, in its efficiency and uh, effectiveness. And with DMT, I think it's particularly unique and interesting in the fact that it seems to take you right into what shamans describe as the tunnel experience. And this is something we talk about at length in our lecture three series on the website, 
Uh, if you go all around the world, you look at all kinds of different shamanic societies, they consistently describe their experience of entering the spirit world as being the experience of entering into a tunnel. And in our series, you know, I have the students implement a lot of different religious methods. They can use psychedelics if they want to, but we try to, you know, teach them to be able to access those experiences without the use of drugs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we encourage the students, you know, to perform meditations, to do fasting, uh, rhythmic chanting, rhythmic prayers. And many of the students have described having this experience of, of seeing this tunnel, this whirling tunnel that will appear, and they move down it. And when they get to the end of that tunnel, uh, they're able to access what seems to them to be a, a different world, a different kind of reality. Of course, it is all rooted in the unconscious. It's all ultimately dreamlike in nature. And so that in and of itself provide or, 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 you know, I think creates some difficulties. You're not talking about an objectively real world the way, you know, this world is physically real. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing to, really nail things down when you talk about those kinds of religious experiences because they are so subtle in nature. Uh, you know, I, I'm reminded actually in talking about this, uh, I heard a comment by Alex Jones once and uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I think he was, he, he was on, I think the Joe Rogan show and he says, you know, these, these, uh, these people, they're mapping the DMT realm, he says, they're mapping. And, you know, for me, I, as soon as I hear somebody say something like that, I immediately know they don't know what they're talking about. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because you know, the, the, the thing about the spirit world and the thing about when you're over there is nothing is solid. Nothing is objective. Everything is constantly changing. So to say, oh, they're mapping the DMT world, well, that would suggest that there's something there physically real that will always be there even when you're not looking at it and i don't think that's really the case you know that when you listen to a lot of people describe their experiences uh in fact one individual that that put it beautifully was shaman oaks he he says you know he met this female entity and she was taking him around and saying look at this and she would just create things you know uh, whole cities could appear whole landscapes and and this really reveals the subtle dreamlike nature to to those experiences which you know ties back directly into what i was talking about before with with issues around science and skepticism because science and skepticism is all about objectivity and ultimately finding things that we can observe consistently and so trying to bring a scientific mindset into understanding something like the dmt experience really represents a major challenge mm. to try and bring the discipline of that kind of thinking in order to help us to understand uh, those kinds of experiences. It's very, it's a very unique situation. Yeah, I suppose yeah. the scientific method wouldn't really apply in some ways, but they can still, the, the mindset really, the, the method itself could apply, but the mindset wouldn't really yeah. say, you know, if you yeah, can't you, prove you, it you in you the literature have sense. To, uh, you have to find that point of compromise. And, and I, I personally, myself, I think that at this point, and this is sort of my own, uh, I don't know, my own theory or, <laughs> you know, what I try to put out there. Uh, the, the thing that I think is the most consistent, the one thing that we can definitively say about the spirit world that is consistent is something that I got from reading the Hindu Upanishads and specifically the Mandukya Upanishad. And, you know, I, I actually put a complete translation of the Mandukya Upanishad into my book because it was, you know, as soon as I read it, I, re I still remember the moment I read it. It's a very short book. It's only a few pages. And as soon as I read it, it even put, it sends chills up my spine talking about it because I realized in that moment, this is it, you know, this, this is the closest thing that we're ever going to have to something that can really uh, be understood scientifically about the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And the Mandukya Upanishad simply breaks down the human mind into four major levels. It says that at the bottom level is the waking experience that we're in right now. That's the waking experience that we occupy while we're conscious. You know, it's a rational problem solving state of mind. Uh, when we go to sleep at night or when we all enter an altered state of consciousness, we can enter the dream state, which is really the spirit world. And this is where you can speak to entities. You can, you know, see the dead. You can move through various landscapes. You know, it's a, it's a reality unto itself. And then higher than that still is the void of dreamless sleep. And the void of dreamless sleep is this vast open void 
that people will describe. They describe it in near death experiences. They describe it in, in altered states. And when you go into that space, you'll experience this vast emptiness. And then beyond that is the white light that people will describe. And that's something you see across many, many different religions as well. And so that, that four level breakdown is something that you can test. That's something you can predict. Yeah, you can make a prediction. You can say, I predict that if you enter an altered state of mm -hmm. consciousness, you can observe these four major facets of the nature of mind. And uh, I think that's really a major, major breakthrough in terms of that thinking. Mm. And your students experience this or? Well, at this point, you know, I, ha I have a lot of reservations about how I want to go about that. And that's kind mm. of an ongoing issue. Because on the one hand, you know, I would like to teach the students how to have these kinds of experiences. But at the on the other hand, I also understand that these experiences can be really traumatic and, and very painful. Uh, it's not pleasant. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, that's one of the humorous things about psychedelics is I say, you know, if, if you're doing psychedelics for fun, uh, that's, that's rather odd to me. You know, it could be, it could be a really traumatizing experience. So <laughs> I, I really am conservative as far as, you know, pushing people, um, into having these experiences to me it's almost like being an astronaut you know i've heard the term psycho not used mm -hmm. and i think that's a fair comparison where you know if, if you really want to enter the spirit world and try to achieve that experience of the white light absolutely and i think we should teach people how to do that but they have to understand the risks and the yeah. dangers and some of the concerns that might come with that as well what do you say to those who wish to have a mystical experience like what you've talked about before absolute factual personal mystical experiences some people say well if it hasn't happened to me in the physical world in the 3d world then it doesn't happen what would you say to those people right now who may be watching going i would like to have something extrasensory take place in my life i'd like to know there's more to life than just this I think, I think it depends on where you're coming from. If you approach that from the angle of saying, like, let's say you've got somebody who's on, you know, their deathbed and they're nearing the end of life and they say they want to have that kind of an experience. Then I think, you know, from what I've read and from what I've seen, the spirit world seems to be very, um, very sensitive to people in that place. And, and they seem to come into that experience with a tremendous positivity. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. For people to be able to access that but if say you've got a young guy who's you know 21 very arrogant very cocky just wants to know you know and and mocks religion and you put an individual like that into an experience it can be profoundly humbling and mm. terrifying and, you know i've uh, i have a good friend who's very atheistic in his thinking and he did DMT and he's never spoken about it. it. You could tell that it just traumatized him and he buried it into his unconscious and just refused to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that's the issue with a lot of these things is that if you want to push someone into those kinds of experiences, then you have to be very careful because where they're coming from has a tremendous effect on, on what kind of a result you end up with. So if a person said, I'm deeply skeptical and I would like to know for myself yes, if yes. they're in a healthy place and, you know, they've got an open mind and they're, and they're psychologically well, I would say, yeah, just be aware that if you bang on that door enough times, it will open. <laughs> and, uh, that's the irony, you know, is, is when I went, and I, I did LSD, I was really worried. That I would that I would use this substance and come away with nothing that I would just see bright colors you know, maybe hear some weird things, maybe music would sound better and that'd be it. And uh, that was a real concern for me. I thought, I don't want to have to do this a bunch of times, mm -hmm. you know, to, to come away with, with the, the experience I'm looking for. But that was no issue. I, I got all that I wanted and then, some, you know, so that's what I mean. You bang on that door and it opens and you go, Oh dear God, <laughs> you know, we're, well, we're on our way. <laughs> God, tell us, can you tell us what happened during your LSD experience? Can you tell us what took place rather than just colors and sounds? Cause that's kind of what it was oh, like yeah. for a lot of us. Yeah. Well, what, what happened was, uh, I, like I mentioned, you know, in the, in the book, I, I was assaulted at a house party, mm -hmm. you know, a, a fella hit me over the head with a baseball bat and, uh, you know, I took that as a real warning that my life was going in a bad way. 
And so I ended up, I decided to do this LSD in the house where I was assaulted, which in retrospect, you know, they always talk about set and setting, probably the worst possible set and setting I could have chosen, but it wasn't, that's the funny thing about a lot of these things. You don't see it until after the fact, and you do feel as if, you know, the, you know, the spirit world has had a hand in maybe leading you a little bit to that experience. But I, I took the LSD with a good friend of mine and his girlfriend, and they put on uh, Pink Floyd live at Pompeii. <laughs> and, you know, if you've never heard it, it's a pretty menacing track. It's, you know, it's all about the volcano erupting and, you know, they show the bodies from Pompeii. And so you know, <laughs> I look back on this and I think, God, what a horrible, you know? <laughs> this couldn't have been any worse. Like how did all of these things line up, you know, LSD assaulted with a bait, you know, Pink Floyd live at Pompeii. Like I'm, I'm going into a bad trip and it's not like anybody, it's not like my friend was trying to take me there, but I was going there. It was clear. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was good in the sense that I knew that the greatest religious experiences would come through bad trips. And so, uh, you know, when I started to feel this, I started to think, my God, I, I think I might be dead. You know, like maybe I died that night when I was assaulted with a baseball bat mm. and I've just been sort of dreaming my life because the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it, it talks about that. It says that when an individual dies, initially, they will have this white light experience, but then they go unconscious. And when after that period has ended, they wake up, and they think they're still alive. They think that they're still normal, they wake up in their bed, they go downstairs, they make themselves a cup of coffee. And then they say good morning to their wife, and she doesn't say anything back. Mm. Well, that was weird, you know, or they go to touch a hot burner on the stove, and they don't feel the heat. And then they walk through, I remember Lama Ole Nidal, he says, one experience is you may walk through snow, look back and see that you haven't left any footprints. And then the feeling and the realization comes, uh oh, I think I might be dead. And so this is uh, something the Tibetan book talks about. And I think intuitively, we know that on some level, because even speaking about it creeps me out. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a creepy thing to describe. Yeah. And uh, so when I started having this conviction, thinking, my God, I might be dead already, you know, it, it made sense to me. And what, uh, what really overtakes you then are very primal instincts, you know, it, and it's remarkable because you can read about all these things. You can read and read and read and learn and learn and learn. But when the experience becomes very real, then you immediately feel your desperation to cling to life and this desperate hope that my God, just please don't let it be true. Please don't let me be dead. And, uh, you know, I remember I went for a walk outside and it was a cold March night. It was just freezing. There was this howling wind and the orange clouds were, you know, going overhead from the city lights. And I remember on the LSD, they were just glowing. And I had this intuition that all of this was dissolving into the West with the setting sun, that the, that the black hole of the setting sun was like swallowing my life. And uh, it was all merely a dream. And so I was resisting this the whole time, trying to convince myself it's just the LSD, it's a bad trip, you know, just hang on to your sanity, you know, don't give in, don't give in. But the intuitions got stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one point, I was walking down the road and I looked down the, the next street and it seemed to me as if it was the same street I had just walked up. And still to this day, I cannot make sense out of how that hallucination was so convincing, but it completely convinced me that the street I was looking down was exactly the same as the street I'd just walked up, mm -hmm. which meant that I could go around this block forever and I would never go anywhere. Okay. And it, it, it felt, uh, I was in hell at that moment. It was <laughs> the most- wow, it sounds it. Yeah, it was it was a horrible, horrible experience. And so I just wished to get out and, and to go to sleep. I remember we got to the house and I went upstairs and I just laid in the bed. I closed my eyes and I said, if this is it, I just want to go peacefully. I just I don't want to suffer anymore. This is horrible. And, uh, you know, I, I remember I laid down in the bed. I might get emotional telling this, but, <laughs> you know, it's a hard thing for me to talk about because it, it brings it up. But um I remember uh, I heard this voice and it said to me, the problem is not what you're seeing. The real problem is your attachment to seeing. Mm -hmm. 
The problem is not what you're hearing. The real problem is your attachment to hearing. And this was Buddhist wisdom. It was things that I had learned from Buddhism. And in retrospect, I believe that that was, in fact, the voice of Amitabha, Buddha Amitabha, that had come to sort of help me through this experience and, and to uh, orchestrate it. And so I realized that I had to listen to the wisdom of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, that I had to overcome my fears and attachments to life so that I could be open to moving on to the next life, that I could be open to moving through this experience and not become trapped in that midway state. Because that's, in some sense, that is hell. When, when you're so attached to your former life that you can't let go, uh, that, that really creates the conditions for hell. And so I recognized that I recognized, oh, my God, you know, I'm dead. OK, I've accepted that, <laughs> you know, this is now the afterlife. And not only that, but I've recognized exactly where I am. And that's really the remarkable thing about great Eastern mystical literature is that, uh, you know, when you journey into these altered states of consciousness, you can identify uh, specific signs to tell you, yes, this is the experience that you're in. And so that really helped me to gain a, a much firmer grip on my sanity and what was going on. But I was mm. still so overwhelmed by horrible feelings of fear, anxiety. And so I recognized in that moment that what I had to do was escape the dreamlike nature of mind and enter into the void of dreamless sleep, as the Mandukya Upanishad says. And so I was trying all of these. That, that was really, in some sense, the craziest part of the whole experience. Because at this point, there's so much fear, so much adrenaline, so much anxiety going on. Uh, I was barely able to hold on to my sanity. And so, you know, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, I started making conclusions that were clearly psychotic. You know, it was clearly a psychotic state because I thought, well, maybe I can dissolve through my best friend's eye, you know, the pupil of his eye, or, you know, maybe I can, maybe I can dissolve by, uh, you know, finding a crack in the floor. And it's fascinating because when you look at psychotics, schizophrenics, people in mental hospitals, you can tell they're trapped in that state, you know, they're, they're, they're stuck there. And, uh, you know, I was desperately trying to work these things out. And at one point I became very uh, overwhelmed. And so I thought, Maybe I can just throw myself down these stairs and I'll break the floor open. Because remember, at this point, I'm convinced this is a dream, right? So I'm like, this, this is not a real thing. I should be able to get out of here. And uh, I climbed to the top of the stairs, threw myself down, hit the floor like a ton of bricks. It hurt like hell. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny because I should have, if I was thinking rationally, I should have stopped and realized, wait, things aren't heavy in the spirit world. So... I must still be alive, but you see, you're not thinking rationally in that state. But uh, anyways, I, when I hit the floor, uh, it just came over me. 16th Karmapa. 16th Karmapa was a, a meditation that we had done as Buddhists. And all of a sudden, this, the, the stupidity of what I had been doing became immediately clear to me. I'm like, oh, I'm losing my mind. I need to meditate. That's, that's what I need to do. I need to meditate. <laughs> And so I, uh, I, I went up into the, into the couch, I sat down, I started to meditate, you know, I, I realized that meditation was the key. And so I got up, I went over to the couch and <laughs> I'll never forget it. You know, I looked at my best friend, Mike and, you know, pardon my language, but I said to him, I'm going to destroy the whole fucking universe. <laughs> <laughs> and what I meant by that. And again, it, it's when you hear it like that, mm -hmm. it's, it's a psychotic thing to say. But what I meant is this is my dream, right? Mm. This is my dream. I know I'm dreaming. I know I'm dead. And I know you're just a projection of my mind. So oh. ultimately, I have power over all of this, and I'm going to bring it to an end. And uh, I started to meditate, and I was concentrating that energy into my central channel. And I took this massive breath in, and I felt this, this snapping sensation in the center of my chest. And then whew, I just went right up out of my body. And I had that kind of a tunnel experience where I just saw everything sort of retreat and disappear. And then I moved out into this vast open void. And I remember quite vividly, I thought, I did it. This is the, this is the void of dreamless sleep. So it was remarkable. You know, I'm moving through this quite consciously, recognizing, identifying things and navigating my way through the experience. And when I did that, this red entity came up out of the sphere that I, that I was on, there was like a sphere there. And I recognized that that was the dream of my life, that I had been living in that, that dream, that simulation, whatever you want to call it. And it emerged out of it. 
And it came up through space and he stood across from me and he says, you're not permitted to be here. You're not allowed to be here. And I said, well, you're not going to stop me from reaching Nirvana. And he says, well, if you ever try and get past me, you will never see your mother again. And it was remarkable because I'm not that particularly attached to my mom. Like we have kind of a mixed relationship, but I, I have recognized that I am a, a, a very much a desire type. So in Buddhism, they say you have different personality types. You have desire types and anger types. And I always have known that I'm a desire type. You know, I don't have a tremendous struggle with my temper, but I definitely don't like hearing no when I want something. <laughs> and the root of that, the Buddha say, is an attachment to one's mother. And the Buddha who looks after those people is the red Buddha Amitabha. And so this all connected after the experience. I realized here I am across from this red entity who's talking about my attachment to my mother with my you know, personality types. So that all really came together in, in helping me to recognize that this was in fact Amitabha. And so I, I ended up, I, I let go of my mother. He actually passed me an object that represented my attachment to her and I let it go. And when I did this feeling of fearlessness came over me and I remember I plunged toward this entity, everything started burning. I felt as if my memories were burning, my identity was burning. I was losing every sense of myself. And I found myself in this vast darkness, this limitless darkness. And I remember thinking one of my last thoughts there was, uh, well, this must be hell. This is where beings go in order to cease to exist. Because uh, I had a very annihilationist kind of a viewpoint at that point. And so I just let go of my mind. And I thought, finally, this is it. This is the end of the horror show. This is the end of the suffering. I can go to sleep, never wake up. And I'm quite okay with that. <laughs> and uh, at that point, you know, as, as the final slivers of my awareness seemed to be slipping away, that was when the white light appeared. And uh, the thing that always gets me is, is what I said was, Jesus, what are you doing here? Mm. And that was because the light, the presence of that light was something that I recognized. It was something that I had come to recognize as a child when I would go to church and I would pray. I never saw Jesus, right? But it was the spirit of that light that, you know, the time I had spent as a Christian, uh, you know, in a, in a good place, in a very open place to God had built with, for me, a relationship with that light. And that was how I learned to recognize it was through the name of Jesus, right? And so I came up into the light and I remember it was just everything I'd ever wanted. It was everything I'd ever longed for. And I, I always love to say, you know, it was not that I wanted to be in the light. I wanted to be the light. It was home. It was where I belonged. And, and I wanted to merge with it and just find that full satisfaction. And uh, <clears throat> when I came into it, that was what happened. I just felt myself merge with this light. And I love the, the Hindu analogy where they say it's like a droplet of water falling into the ocean. It just becomes the ocean. And that's exactly what I felt. It was, there was no me experiencing God. There was no moment where in which I was experiencing God or, or any relative sense of God is here. And I, there was just this one all pervasive sense of fulfillment, awareness, and life that was infinite. And, and it was me and I was it and it was all one. Mm. And then I emerged from that light. And when I came out of it, I saw a star and I started to plunge toward it. And then I felt myself come back into my body. Mm. And I remember I took in this deep breath and I sat up and I looked around and I thought this, you know, I was back in the living room where I had left my body and I looked around and, and rather than being in hell, I was in heaven. It was, it was everything I had ever wanted. And I was just blown away by the wonder of seeing. I remember that I said, uh, I, I got, one of the first things I said is I got up and I looked around and I said, I can see, you know, and, and my friend who was sitting over there, he says, what do you want to see? And I've always thought that statement in itself expresses so much uh, wisdom of enlightenment because mm -hmm. a Buddha is happy due to the fact that they are experiencing everything as fresh and meaningful and new, they have no attachment to life. So no matter what happens, it's wonderful because it can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not good or bad. What do you want to see? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the ego. The ego says, you know, I want to see this, but I don't want to see that. It's that dualistic mm -hmm. thinking, whereas enlightened mind just celebrates life in and of itself. 
And so I laughed when he said that, and I looked around and I remembered, and this is the remarkable thing, I remembered the creation of the universe. I remembered everything. I remembered how life was always here, that this was the game that we all play. And I looked over and I realized that me and the other people in the room were the same person, mysteriously. We were like the same person looking out through different eyes. And uh, I just laughed and laughed. It was wonderful. I thought this is the greatest thing ever, you know? And uh, I'm often reminded of what Alan Watts, he says, you know, what would you do if you were God? If you could do anything, you know, well, you'd probably dream a dream. And, and at first you'd think about pleasure gardens and, you know, palaces and you'd be Royal and you'd eat all the food, but that'd get boring. So you'd win for yourself, some enemy, you'd make up an enemy and you'd go to war, but you know, you'd always win because you're God, you'll always win. Right. So that'd get boring. And then you'd say to yourself, what if I dream a dream and forget that I'm the dreamer? You know, what if I orchestrate this whole thing? step inside of it and forget that I'm the one who built it all, you know? And he says, how do you know that's not what you're doing? And that's exactly what I observed. That's exactly what I experienced. Wow. That is just, that is, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's had a really big effect on me. I can tell Uh, you moved. Yeah. We're counting the story. I can see that. I can see it in you, in your eyes. I mean, it's just so moving. I just saw it quiet listening to what you were saying it's just (laughs) so tell me Wes, when you've studied all the because you have on your website there's obviously for students to look at the different religions and draw parallels or not as they want to there's no pressure obviously how have you gone about because for me when i study say a biblical text or the hindu or the quran or any text immediately it's overwhelming because it's just massive they're tomes and they're Mm -hmm. huge how have you got how have you got through that, that initial sort of wow to actually look at these? Well, that's uh, that was the big challenge. And that that's what really preceded all of this was I understood that in order to make sense out of religion, you have to find a common thread or some simple kernel of an idea that ultimately can serve as the cornerstone you might say for everything else to blossom out of and so that's really what i was oftentimes looking for maybe consciously maybe unconsciously sometimes but i knew like for instance uh you know i I, i've always been a fan of physics and if you look at the history of physics it's always been this process of narrowing down uh you know merging electricity and magnetism into electromagnetism with uh you know the uh, maxwell's equations and uh, albert einstein merging Uh, general relativity with light and gravity and Newton merging the heavens with the earth. You know, there's always this sense of bringing things together. And right now, physicists are looking for what they call the theory of everything, where quantum physics and and relativity merge. Mm -hmm. And so I understood that, you know, making sense out of religion must follow a similar pattern, that there must be some fundamental thing that stands at the root of all this diversity that we see. And I really recognize that through Carl Gustav Jung, Uh, in his work, where he realized that it was ultimately the unconscious mind, that if you look at all religions all around the world, you can always find at one point or another, they make a reference to dreams, visions, and altered states of consciousness. Mm. And once you understand that, it really helps you to sort of eliminate a lot of the confusing information and really narrow in on, on what's essential. And so, for example, right now, Uh, I'm taking the students through our lecture 10 series about the Bible. And that represents a real challenge because like you said, it's a tome. I mean, this is a huge book and there are so many different avenues you can take for, you know, talking about exegesis, talking about the history of the text, talking about the theology, the, the Trinitarian theology versus Jewish. I mean, you could just get lost in that. So what I try to do through the courses is really, you know, cut a trail that concentrates on those mystical experiences. So obviously I want the students to know, you know, how we can tell one book's authentic over another or touch on some of those big ideas. But ultimately, I think the key to making sense out of religion is to really ignore a lot of the diversity and a lot of the complexity and really focus in on, okay, what is essentially the same here as over here? And, yeah. and and I found uh, the way I structured the courses, I started them with San Bushman uh, traditions, and it, it really works wonderfully, where if you understand 
the traditions of the San Bushmen who live in South Africa and in, in the Kalahari and, and their trance dance traditions. It really is such an old tradition and it's such a pure tradition in the sense that it hasn't had the opportunity to become so complex. You can really take that very basic understanding of this ancient, ancient religion, probably the oldest religion in the world, and then you just trace it up through all modern faiths. Wow. And you, you can see that ultimately all of these religions are just sort of uh, amalgamations or adaptations of this fundamental shamanic experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, good observation. And, and a final question I'd love to know. When you've, when you've looked at the different um, uh, traditions, so the religious traditions, do they follow a same pattern? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the distinctions come at the fringes is the way I like to think of it. It's yeah. like, you know, for instance, uh, you know, I, for some reason, I'm, I'm drawn to Islam right now. And, you know, Islam is a religion that I that I had a really difficult time with, especially as a Catholic, uh, trying to understand it, trying to make sense out of it. But yeah. ultimately, if you look at what Muhammad did, Muhammad uh, journeyed into the mountains around Mecca, and he prayed and fasted and he would, you know, use these methods, which shamans use all the time. They pray and they fast and they, you know, the native Indians actually here in Alberta, there, there's pots where they would go on vision quest and they would fast for four days at a time until a vision came to them. And so Muhammad was doing this and he, eventually he heard a voice and the voice said to him, right and it was the voice of Jibril, the angel Gabriel. And yeah. so that is the, the source of Islam, is this visionary experience. And Muhammad often reported how spontaneously he'd hear voices. You know, a voice would come up. Well, if that were to happen today, you'd say that individual psychotic, right? They have a <laughs> mental health problem. So, you know, you, you look at that and you realize this is ultimately where all of these religions come from. I mean, even with Christianity, Jesus's journey into the wilderness is... Yeah how the gospels begin. And it's after that, that Jesus comes back into the community and professes that he is the divine incarnate, which if you travel over to India and you look at what uh, the Bhagavad Gita has to say, you know, Krishna is he who dwells within the heart and that ultimately we are all Vishnu dreaming. We are all divine. And the process of enlightenment is peeling away the layers of illusion to come to that ultimate realization of I am. Uh, you know, I'm really excited, actually, in our Lecture 10 series, we're about to talk about Moses. And when Moses confronts Yahweh on Mount Sinai, he says to him, my name is I am. And uh, you go to the Upanishads and you read about their understanding of Brahman. And they say that God's name is he is or I am. And it's clear those two traditions yeah. never exchanged ideas, especially yeah. such a central idea. So it becomes very clear that ultimately we are talking about uh, this realization of this, yeah. of this oneness of consciousness that, that exists. And of course, they were continents apart and thousands of years between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not to mention the language gap. Yeah, know, not to, the, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's remarkable. So it's, and when you go over to near-death experiences, you find the same thing. I, I remember hearing one fella, he described God as being like a galaxy of stars and each individual star was a soul, a conscious being. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you know, we were all God. It's, I was God, you were God, we were all God as one great collective yeah. uh, being. And so, you know, you see that, you see, okay, the Hindus are saying this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you peel away the layers, you can see the Bible is saying this, you know, all of these different religions are saying this. And uh, then when you couple it with observations in NDEs, as well as duplicate it with psychedelics, I mean, right there, you've got, I mean, that's, a, that's as good a proof as you're ever going to get for anything. I mean, you know, that's, there's probably as much evidence, you know, if, if you did the research and you worked it all out, there's as much weight supporting that as there would be the theory of evolution. I mean, the theory of evolution is built from observations gathered from various different places and, you know, weaving the connections together. And, uh, I think I think that's where we're at. I think we're seeing the birth of of uh, of a really confident understanding of these things. Yeah, a new renaissance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A, re a, new a renaissance. That's true. And thank you for all the work that you do to bring this out into the world to look at the commonalities of all the. Instead of our differences, we're looking at the commonalities of all the world's religions, sciences, and philosophies. There was one thing I wanted to be able to talk to you about, um, but I don't know if we're going to have time. But you kind of encapsulated it at the end about the face of God, seeing the face of God. You had a video about that. 
when it got mm. right down to it, the face that was looking back at you was your own, was it not? Mine. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, it's I, that's one of the uh, that's one of the most compelling experiences uh, that I've had because oh. you know when when that happened, I had no idea about any of these things. Because early on. Yeah, it was very, I was only a teenager, oh. you know, I'd never really been introduced to Hinduism or any of this. I was a proper Pentecostal Christian. And that just blew up my theology in so <laughs> many ways. You know, How can God's face be my face? That makes yeah, no, I remember it. sitting on the bus, you know, and thinking that makes no sense. And it was so traumatic. It was so troubling that I dismissed yeah. it and I buried it. I said, no, that, that had to have been a mistake that couldn't have been right. And uh, yeah, then later on, when I started studying the Upanishads, you know, a chill would run up my spine yeah. and I'd go, oh my God, this is, this is real. Yeah. You know, this is, this is really <laughs> yeah. how these things work. Yeah. That's the, that's the knowing of it, isn't it? When you, 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 you can sense it, that it's, uh, it's somewhere in you as well. It's that um, mirroring of this information. It's a wonderful feeling. I mean, I could sit here all day, but I'm sure Wes yeah. <laughs> loads of things to do. Once you. again, I uh, encourage everyone to go to Westcott's um, website, the enlightened-university.com. He's also got his book, which is a wonderful um, read. And he's also accessible on YouTube as a YouTube channel. This concludes our wonderful discourse with our dear friend Westcott. It's been an absolute pleasure with Anne as well. I'm Kelly. Thanks. I'm Lyndon Smith. And this concludes tonight's edition of Living Theosophy in D. All it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the end of the video. Here we are backstage at Living Theosophy 2.0. So if you like the video, please like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so you can be notified when Living Theosophy has a brand new video. And there's lots of things happening here at Living Theosophy. And uh, I, for a long time, didn't want to ask if you would like and subscribe because I was trying to be humble. But without the algorithm, these teachings can't get out to where they need to be. So I'm going to say, please like and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you back here. I love you. <laughs>